peace. Take your seat. The Lord be with you. You know, every time I give a homily for the first time to a congregation, I get nervous because I fear giving one so boring that I lose your attention in the first two minutes. I remember as a newly ordained deacon, a baby in the first pew started to cry the moment I started my sermon. And the mother flustered, got up to bring the, the child out. And I said, ma'am, you don't have to go. The child doesn't bother me. And then she said, yes, but you're bothering the child. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> uh, oh, I thought Barbara had the moniker up there. Anyway, I love today's gospel, mo gospel moniker of um, Doubting Thomas. Because for many of us, he is us with our human doubts. Does the final verse rebuke Thomas whose faith depends upon seeing Jesus versus those who believe without seeing him? Reminds me of the saying, I'm from Missouri, you gotta show me. Yeah, in that way, he's not so different from many of us who can believe only if Christ appears. But I look at it in contrasting two ways of coming to faith. One is through physical sight, while the other is through hearing and believing the gospel by witnesses. And this last one places all Christians of all times on the same level plane before God as the original disciples, but minus the experience. Anyways, Father Malcolm suggested I introduce myself properly to y'all so <laughs> you can get a better idea of the how, why, and what I'm doing here. Uh, let me tell you it by way of a story. Uh, you all know I'm Father Luis. We, you know how Hispanics always have a string of names. So my name is Luis Antonio, Maniero, Alves, whatever. Forget it. Father Luis. <laughs> <laughs> In questioning a walk of faith, for years we know about a child who actually did open the way for us to see Christ in action. Even as we question the Lord's call. Let me tell you about Antonio, a child of mixed European Malay Chinese heritage, big beautiful eyes, shock of blonde hair, and an engaging smile. Try to imagine a blonde white child surrounded by a, a sea of brown faces in the Philippines, in Asia. Quite something to, <coughs> to wonder at. But now let your imaginations run. Picture it, Manila, 1946-1948. The most devastated city after world, of World War II, after Berlin and Warsaw. This child, Antonio, was born out of wedlock. And his attractive single mom arrived at Manila's rough and tumble, wild west port area from the peaceful but impoverished islands in the south. Everybody had to go to Manila to, to survive. There was no work, nothing, no food. Now, it's pitch black. Midnight, with mere pockets of light punctuating oases where shadowy figures scuttered around like rats under dim flickering street lamps hanging desperately and dangerously from overhead moorings. My goodness, it must have been horrifying, terrifying for her all alone. She held a cab, avoiding the dregs of society's misfits swirling around them, thieves, murderers, opium dealers. She asked the driver to wait while she went for the suitcases, leaving the two-year-old Antonio with the cab driver. Sadly, she was never seen or heard from again. To this day, Antonio does not know if she abandoned him or if she was killed to become just another mute war statistic. Okay, the child passed from family to family, ending up with a Spanish couple who immediately adopted him. They were financially comfortable, so they sent him to the best schools in Europe, America, where he studied law, a bachelor in marketing, a master in business, diplomate in theology, and finally a doctorate in divinity. Throughout his life, Antonio felt called to ministry, but he continuously questioned it. At 13, he spent a summer with the American LaSalle brothers, but he, did, he disliked the restrictions. Huh, 13 year old kid. At 16, he visited the Lebanese Maronite Monastery. He couldn't undertake the austerity. At 17, he went with the Spanish monks of St. Benedict. He questioned the beads rules. 
At 21, he finally went on his way to join the USA Big Brothers program in college. And afterwards, he got employed. He became a man about town, sought after by the ladies, something of a bon vivant, enjoying a sociable and luxurious lifestyle. When he married, he undertook his mission seriously. Now, my wife, Marlies, who was here at the 8 o'clock mass, she does exist. She's not a figment of my imagination. But she works. Somebody has to earn the income, okay? She and I were invited, involved in youth ministry since the 70s. In 1984, we focused on fighting child prostitution in the popular sex tourism in the sin capitals of Asia, Manila, Hong Kong, Singapore. One could even engage a child for a McDonald's cheeseburger and a Coke. In 1984, the term Eurasian, European Asian mixes, changed to Amerasian when U.S. Congress enacted a public law referencing all multiracial Asians after the Vietnamese War, when all kinds of American soldiers worked throughout Asia. Meanwhile, back to Antonio. He eventually married an American girl. They adopted Asian twins and had two biological kids. In 2000, he entered the Catholic diaconate program in San Francisco, but had to return to Manila when his aunt developed severe dementia. Now, the Asian Catholic Church did not have, still does not have a diaconate program. So his Anglican wife introduced him to the Episcopal bishop who received him and eventually ordained him priest. He was ordained at 70, and he holds the dubious distinction of being the oldest ordinant in the Philippine Anglican province. He held some, uh, successful ministries in hospital, jail, prostitution, drug rehab, even church planting saying masses in commercial malls. He became the quintessential mall rat, and he was called <laughs> the mall priest. This is proof that it's okay to, uh, to question the Lord, like uh, Doubting Thomas did, see? And he stuck, that's an actor's rendition. I can't imagine somebody doing that. Ew, sticking my <laughs> finger. Anyway, this is proof it's okay to question the Lord. But once he decides what he wants for you, there is no getting around it. His will be done. No matter how long, how circuitous, or how complicated. See, the story is not so much about Antonio, but to show that faith doesn't always come easily. Secondly, it narrates what um, the resurrection, it, what it takes for people in our time to believe since it is impossible to establish really the facticity of the resurrection. You can't. Either you got to believe it or not. My father-in-law used to say that. You got to want to. <laughs> what is clear is that faith and resurrection are consistent with one another since both speak of creation out of nothing. Ex nihilo. It is trust grounded in insight into the reality of God to grasp what God is capable of doing and how Jesus fits into the bigger picture. The story of Jesus continues to engage the entire world and calls us to believe in him as risen Lord. Remember that blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. My goodness, you're all blessed because you're here. You're here as faith believers. We feel most for those who are not here, the skeptical ones, due to Satan's most skillful tool, pride. What prevents us from seeing what cannot be seen but only felt through faith. Yet we mustn't give in to frustration. We must be ambassadors, proved by our action and faith that we love the doubting Thomases around us. Amidst our own doubts and fears, remember our crucified Lord and Savior will always come to us and say, Shalom Aleichem, peace be with you. Oh, by the way, you know what happened to Antonio? finally retired as an Episcopal priest and helps out at St. Cuthbert. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 